very true very yeah. true all right let's continue um and I, i know you've got you've got quite an an, an introduction the um lila so, so let's let's continue um going through um on the the content that you've prepared for today this the series will be made available um online via the radio 786 uh, soundcloud page and the radio 786 website that's www.radio786.com and uh, lila will be with us for a good couple of months so you know we'll be, we're going to take as much as much knowledge from her as she give us um and as we mentioned you know this this first set of 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 programs um just re- leading up to um just about ramadan we will be focusing on on sedna asia lesson yes um asia uh so we're going to start the conversation about her especially her as a as a privileged woman and uh next week inshallah so there's three things about asia that i notice and it's three things that society likes to use against women mm-hmm. the first aspect of asia is that she is elite woman and that to say she is a, an elite woman wow that's an understatement and i'm going to go into a little bit more detail in just a moment uh because a lot of scholars like ramesses the second as the the pharaoh of musa alayhi salam mm-hmm. so do i i have a lot of reasons for liking ramesses the second in fact he was a very he was a very arrogant man he was like what the most arrogant pharaoh egyptologists independently also say so okay based on their evidence that out of all the pharaohs he was the most obnoxious he was the most conceited he was he was the most grandiose okay and there's a couple of things that I will point out mm-hmm. um but for now what what is interesting is that if Ramesses II is the pharaoh of Musa then there's a there's a very strong possibility mm-hmm. that Nefertari could have been Asia Okay. And we're going to go into to depth and detail about that inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. So, uh may Allah guide us in that and Amen. I pray that I'm not wasting my time going t- down this mm-hmm. rabbit hole, but there are some very interesting details to be considered. Mm-hmm. So, um we're going to start the conversation with Asia as the lead woman going to more depth than that. Then I'm hoping by next week inshallah we will talk more about her being a barren woman. Mm-hmm. Uh because it's assumed and I'm actually double check because it's it's a common belief among scholars that she couldn't have children. Okay. And um and I also used to think so. Yeah. Um I I'm still inclined towards that. But the bottom line is, is that um I've written a whole article about her being a barren woman but the significance of her finding Musa alayhi salam and the connection between the two and this basically a rejection rejection is a direction theme okay because we always we think about what we can't have instead of thinking of what we can, can do, do because as agents of Allah you have to think about well, what can I do yes. you know where where can I take my maternal energy mm-hmm. and my protectiveness yeah. and where can I direct that mm-hmm. uh then inshallah after that we will look more into narcissism and abuse yes. and try to look at more practical ways of dealing with that inshallah mm-hmm. inshallah yeah mm-hmm. all right so uh we've got about we've still got some time before we before we get into before it's time for us to take a break so i think let's let's start off this discussion on on asia as um as an elite woman oh, wow. so who who is asia alayhi <sighs> salam okay so in the time of ramesses the second let's start with him So Ramesses the 2nd wasn't actually of royal lineage he was actually of um his forefathers were they military they were military leaders okay that conquered Egypt okay and he was about third generation i think mm-hmm. his father was was a brilliant military genius and he also uh, led a, a massive war against the Hittites i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing right Hittites Hittites but it was like 6000 people died it mm-hmm. was a massive war um so he was also involved in combat from a very early age okay. um he was given roles in the military i think from the age of 10 onwards he even had his own harem by the time he was 12 mm-hmm. uh then what happened was that he he became fair he was fair for about like 60 years okay. much longer than all the other fairs and, and that's a big reason why a lot of scholars uh Christian Jewish and Muslim scholars a lot of them like him as as most fair because of the fact that he was a fair for so long okay. But now let's talk about his arrogance. Yes. Okay, so this is what the Egyptologists have discovered about Pharaoh or Ramesses II. His father besides being a military genius was also incredibly refined with his artistic tastes. And so under his father, Seti I think his name was, if I remember correctly, he had these columns and he had these carvings that were incredibly refined and detailed. Okay. But now what his son did is that his son actually scratched over them okay and then actually engraved his own name 
over, over his father's his, buildings okay. so that people would think that he was the one that commissioned the buildings and had all these great ideas okay so basically stole his father's um his father's work basically it's okay. like scratched out his father's signature and wrote his own yeah. so there's a specific um oval shape that is written where, where the the fairies write their names mm-hmm. uh rames is the six so now four, four generations away uh, Ramesses the six when he when it was his turn to do all these engravings and these carvings and these buildings and architecture, he did the the carving so thick that if you actually look at the hieroglyphics, there's a circle that means Ra. That's how you can tell. You can actually figure out which is Ramesses' work because you can see the the Ra and then the, the rest of the letters correspond with with his name. So Ramesses the six, he did it so deep that you can actually fit your fist in, 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 into the Ra. Because he didn't want anybody else to come along right, and scratch out okay. his stamps and his carvings. <laughs> because so he learned from his ancestors. It just shows, it just shows you how conceited uh, Ramesses II was and what yeah. a fake person he was. Mm-hmm. That okay. he w- that he wanted to be like, like how grandiose he was yeah. as a narcissist. Uh, so Egypt tries to have found that sort of evidence specifically with that pharaoh. Yeah. And uh, he did this other monument overlooking. It was facing, it was facing, facing, facing. Uh, he did this monument where he did himself as a as a giant statue with the the quote unquote gods as smaller. Okay, yes. So you can see through the artwork that he's actually making himself a god, bigger, making him bigger than the other gods. Mm-hmm. Um, and then his wife, he actually had her at the size of his knee. Okay, so she's like the little woman. Right. Okay. But then there's another monument mm-hmm. that was dedicated to her. Where you show them of 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 the same level, similar similar size. Okay. So if you look at the statue of her and you look at the statue of him, she's about maybe a centimeter shorter than him. Okay. Okay. And then if you go inside the tomb, there is a image of him taking his enemies by the hair and and killing them, mm-hmm. and she's basically standing behind him as like a royal cheerleader. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's a lot of it's like a big massive billboard that mm-hmm. faces the deserts so that all their enemies could see, could see them and uh, be mm-hmm. be forewarned that like this is our great power this is how this is how much technology we have this is how advanced we have that mm-hmm. we have all this this great sculpture and um, so he put a lot of emphasis on his image yes typical politician put a, a lot of very image conscious mm-hmm. now he had about 20 concubines, about nine wives. Mm -hmm. So he had a lot of wives, but there was one wife that stood out. Yeah. That was Nefertari. Nefertari was of noble lineage. Okay. So she stood out of having the highest noble lineage. She, her lineage um, is quite complicated, but it's, her lineage relates to the previous royal lineage, but is not quite directly descended from the previous royal family. Okay. From the previous kingdoms. So like a cousin. Some cousin, cousins, 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 cousins yeah. yeah. And uh, what made her special, she basically became like the favorite wife. Mm-hmm. You'll notice that in America or in some countries, there's the term first lady. Yes. Now, why is she called the first lady? Lady, lady because she's not the only oh, yeah. lady <laughs> she's the first lady yes. because she's the favorite lady mm-hmm. and she is the one that stands by Besides the king the as the mm-hmm. main queen now uh egypt has believed that nefertari specifically came into that role because she was quote unquote god's wife okay okay who or what was that if you go into Egyptology, there is a long line of royal women, mm-hmm. uh, including Lady Pharaohs, who had this role of "quote unquote" God's wife, which is the wife of Amun. Okay. Amun was the one of the gods of that specific area. Yes. Okay, and he was considered the the Lord of the Lords, God mm-hmm. of the Gods, the main the main one that birthed all the other gods, or was leader of the other gods. And uh, so she actually had the 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 outfit mm-hmm. that's consistent to all the women before her so according to the hieroglyphics and their texts there's a lot of evidence to show that she was basically in this role where she would actually go to the statue dance around the statue and give it um offerings, offerings. You understand? Okay. so the the tradition was that in the summer mm-hmm. she would she would have to go whoever the god it, it was only royal woman only uh, only a woman from the royal family could fulfill this role yeah. So she would go, she would perform the ritual of doing an offering and basically it was to appease Amun uh-huh. so that the Nile River could gush forth and make the land fertile. fertile. You understand? Okay. So it was a whole life giving process that uh-huh. they that they were thinking of and aiming towards. 
Um, and so she has the outfit, but what's interesting about her is that if you look at images of her in her tomb and in other statues, it's the same outfit. It's almost like a uniform, mm-hmm. but she kind of changes it a bit. Okay. So at one point, it looks like a tank top. Yeah. So she's, you know, being a typical fashionista and that she, you know, likes to mix it up and, and keep it different. Mm-hmm. Um, they, I've even seen videos where they show how, how in the old days they used to do the makeup. Yeah. Um, like really bright red lipstick and like mm-hmm. turquoise eyes. And and if you look at the, the, mur- the murals, mm-hmm. they used to crush gemstones and paint the murals with gemstones. Okay. Like that's how extravagant they were. Yes. There was so much gold that gold didn't really have much value to them. Yeah. So you'll see Nefertari has these like silver earrings Mm -hmm. that she's very proud of because she's the only one that has silver earrings. She got them from Greece. Okay. So she was getting presents from other royal families and she was also giving presents to the Hittites. I hope I'm pronouncing them correctly because she was a very uh, intelligent, highly educated and very skillful diplomat that actually helped to end that massive war between Egypt and the Hittites. Mm -hmm. She um, wrote to them in her own hand and she also advised her husband to marry one of the princesses so that to have the ties of kinship to, to, yeah, to, to in order to have peace yes mm-hmm. so um, so the more I research her the more I'm liking her yeah. because of the fact that she's intelligent and she's diplomatic and she has all these wonderful positive qualities um, what's even more interesting is that she just disappeared according to the Egyptologists, according to the historians. Okay. Some believe that she got sick mm-hmm. and she didn't see the monuments that were dedicated to her uh, because, again, that was all for show. It's all for the publicity, yes. you know, the billboards for the for the political image. Political campaign. Yes. Um, <laughs> because the thing is, she was like, I would compare her based on research to who the Pope is, the Queen of England, merged into one she's got the celebrity clout she's got that attractive appeal like if you remember princess diana was Mm -hmm. completely stalked and harassed by tabloids but remember princess diana was very pretty and attractive yes she had that celebrity appeal Appeal, but she was also a royal yes so that got very intense Mm -hmm. uh nefertari had that appeal she was incredibly stylish and attractive but she was also a, a dutiful royal mm-hmm. that was actually working politically okay. using her intellect and she had a very high religious position as well right. which Ramesse specifically used to advance his own position mm-hmm. okay now I, I I love that the uh, we'll, we'll chat more about that position we very quickly have to have to take a break um, and when we get back we'll continue in studio um, with me this morning is Lila Halsingen and this is part one in finding our direction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the best of women. We start off with by reflecting on the life of Sayyidina Asiya.